Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Jaws Art History Podcast. Today I'm bringing you a little bonus episode because tis the season of goodwill and why on earth would I not bring you lovely people over the Christmas holiday, an amazing story from within art history which actually starts 100 years ago and finished really rather recently. Today we're going to be talking about an incredible painting by the Austrian artist Gustav Klimt called Portrait of Adele Blockbauer, which was painted in 1907 and is an oil on, well technically an oil on canvas, but is also as part of his gold series, which this was actually the last in his series of very sort of heavily ornate gold leaf and silver leaf infused paintings. And actually only about 12% of the canvas is actually given over to oil paints. Anyway, I digress. So, what is so great about this painting? Well, first of all, it's an absolute corker. It is beautiful, very detailed, very fine, and again, very iconic, like I said, one of Klimt's gold series. However, in this one painting, you have the artist, you have the Nazis, you have Estee Lauder, and you have Ryan Reynolds, all linked back to this one painting. Now, you may have seen a few years ago that it was a film release called The Women in Gold, and this film is all about the history of this painting, which I'm going to share with you now if you haven't seen the film at all. I'll hold my hand up and say I personally haven't seen this, however, when I was studying my masters at Kingston University, we did a module on art law and this was one of the paintings that we discussed. It was actually a whole a whole lesson dedicated to the history of it and the law which surrounded how this work became basically the centre stage of a global lawsuit almost between Austria and some wee women in the United States. But we'll get on to that. I don't want to get I don't want to give you all the juicy gossip straight off the bat. Anyway, so just sit back and relax as I tell you the history of the portrait of Adele Lobbauer. So I feel the best way to begin this episode is to describe this painting by Klimt because really the next 20 odd minutes or so are, are really going to be all about this painting and the fight to get it back to its rightful owners. So it's this beautiful large square canvas and there's there's a figure clad in this incredibly ornate gold dress which is covered with sort of very different eye motifs the whole way down and she sits in this beautiful wing-backed chair and the gown sort of flows down from the chair onto the ground and the back of the room behind the chair is this incredible gold leaf, almost kind of like textured wallpaper. And I would really say about 90% of this canvas is, is gold or silver leaf. It's really very ornate and beautiful and just instantly recognisable as Klimt. Now Klimt, for those who perhaps don't know him by name, Gustav Klimt is an Austrian artist and his most famous work is something quite similar to this. It's called The Kiss. But it's a couple, again, sort of surrounded by gold leaf and these beautiful flowers, which kind of cascade down as the sort of gentleman lovingly holds his beloved in his hands and kisses her. And it's this incredibly they're monumental piece within the history of art and comes from the same series called Klimt's Gold series. But actually... He only painted four or five of his works in gold leaf and although better known for these, he also produced a lot of landscapes. He's got an incredible series of forests and orchards as well as portraits not sort of completely decorated within gold leaf. This was commissioned actually by Adele Blockbauer's husband, Frederick Blockbauer, who was an incredibly wealthy sugarcane merchant in Vienna. Now, you might think, how on earth is a sugarcane merchant in Vienna? I don't know the ins and outs of it. However, this is how the family made their millions, and they were incredibly wealthy. And Gustav Klimp was actually an incredibly successful artist within his life, and he was very much championed by the avant-garde Jewish wealth in Austria and Vienna, particularly Vienna, where he frequented. 
And this is where the Blochbauers had their permanent residence and they actually commissioned Klimt a few times to paint Adele, once in 1907, which is this beautiful gold study, and once again in 1912, which is complete polar opposites and very much an oil on canvas based work. There's nothing flashy or divine about how he later depicts Adele. However, back onto this painting. What we do know about this painting is that Klimt made hundreds of pencil studies of Adele sitting in a winged back chair. So kind of like one of those sort of wicker back chairs. And there's there's roughly about a hundred studies of Adele both sitting and standing in these beautiful gowns in her home in Austria. And I'll link a couple of images below just so you can get a sense of his studies before he actually paints the work and these studies are really interesting actually to see because initially it's not particularly obvious that she's sitting in a chair she you know she's surrounded by something but it's really not very obvious that it's a chair in which she sits in so the work was commissioned by Adele's husband and it hung in the family's home in Austria until it was confiscated at their family home after it was raided by the Nazis. Now, the home was raided by the Nazis in the Anschluss, which was when, overnight, really, the Austrian Jews had their lives completely turned upside down. And Frederick, Adele's husband, who ran a very wealthy company, was essentially given um, a statement by the Nazis saying that he had paid the wrong tax to the wrong government, i.e. he shouldn't have been paying Austrian tax, he should have been paying tax directly to the Nazis. And because of that, he was fined heavily. On top of being fined heavily, parts of ways of paying them back was also to take away Jewish, well, wealthy Jewish patrons' arts. Because as you may or may not know, Hitler was a failed painter and it was his dream to actually set up his own museum. So he kind of had his own little mini mission with, with you know, conquering Europe wasn't enough. His own sort of personal mini mission within there was to start collecting incredible art to open his own museum in his hometown. However, Klimt didn't really make the cut, but that's a different story for a different day. So the house was raided and the paintings in the family's collections were seized by the Nazis. Now, by this point in time, Adele had, had sadly passed away and had left the paintings to her husband in the will, stating that she wanted her husband to have the paintings, but after he died, she would really like it if the paintings went to the Austrian State Museum. Now, this is an important fact that we'll come back to later, so she would like them to go there. However, in this day and age, which was 1938-1939, it wasn't very progressive in the way that it is today and that regardless of a will or not, the works technically still belonged to Adele's husband, Frederick, because he was the one that had commissioned them. And also it was a, still in that day and age where regardless of a female's independent wealth, her husband naturally, upon marriage, became the rightful owner of everything that she had. But we're not here to talk about that. So the paintings were seized and Frederick fled Austria during the war and lived out his days in a hotel in Zurich, where, of course, Switzerland was very famously a neutral state and didn't take part in World War One or World War Two. So he lived in a hotel for the rest of his days and he actually sadly died in the November of 1945. Now, the Bloch Bowers, their family got completely spread out as they all tried to flee in different in different directions. And the majority of them ended up in California and some ended up in Canada. Now, when the war ended and the family members that survived that were in America and Vancouver, they tried to recover their family property, which of course naturally you, you would want to. And they found out that their works had bypassed Hitler, the, the Klimt's were far too contemporary for Hitler, and they had been sold to the Belvedere Gallery in Vienna because they'd caught the eyes of the museum officials, so instead of being destroyed, they, they said, oh, we'll take them. So the family tried after the war to recover the works, claiming that they were the rightful heirs, which thousands and thousands of families did, and it's actually still a problem to do, and there's still funds set up of families that are trying to rightfully, still trying to rightfully reclaim works and objects that belonged to, to their ancestors during the war that were seized during the Nazis, and they're still sort of fighting out the bit with their own countries or museums and so on and so on. So it's still a big mess. However, the family tried to claim that they were the rightful heirs 
And this is where Austria gets very tricky. So when all these works were recovered, what happened was they were returned to the original countries because by this time, sometimes if works had found their way into Germany or Austria or Poland, they tried to find the country of origin of the works and then they were returned to the country of origin. So luckily for the family, the works had remained in the museum, so they were still in very good condition. However, even though they, they could prove that they were the rightful owners, due to exportation restrictions, their requests were unsuccessful. Essentially, it was the Austrian state blocking any sort of Austrian treasures being exported out of Austria um, to all the Jewish families, which quite rightly so did not want to come back to Austria after the war had ended. And the family managed to retrieve a handful of paintings and objects that belonged to the Blockbauers, but essentially their requests were unsuccessful for the Klimts and they abandoned the idea of retrieving their works and just assumed that was them, that they were lost. And realistically, going by Adele's will, the family believed they should go to the museum. Not the museum they were in, but they should be in a museum. So that was that. However, in 1998, that all changed. In New York, in 1998, there was a seizing of two paintings by another Austrian painter called Egon Schiele during an exhibition as they were claimed to be stolen and not rightfully returned to their owners after World War II. They were loaned to the museum by the Austrian government and the Austrians were outraged that America could claim such horrendous things and said, absolutely not, we have no stolen artefacts in our museum collections anywhere. We have the correct provenance, look it up if you don't believe us. So this amazing journalist, Hubertus Schernin, decided to do a little investigating of his own. And he went in to the museum archives in Austria, whereupon he discovered the exportation restrictions and the extortionate measures which museums had imposed on the owners of works seized by the Nazis during the war, meaning Although they were rightfully the owners, they were unable to rightfully claim them. What he also discovered during his digging around was that many of the provenance, which for people that don't know what provenance is, is kind of the backstory of where a work has come from. So for example, it's kind of like if you do a modern day shipping document and you track it online, it shows you it's been here, it's been here, it's been there. You know, it's been at the de you know, it's been picked up, it's at the depot, it's out for delivery. It's kind of the same, only it would be like it was commissioned by this family directly from the artist. It was then inherited by their son. Their son donated this piece to the museum in such a year. That's a, just a very brief idea of a very brief overview of what provenance is. So this journalist went in and actually realized that a lot of the provenance that the museum was claiming to have on file was incorrect and completely fantasized. And in the case of this beautiful gold painting of Adele, the guidebook for the museum actually said it was donated by the sitter in 1936. Yet he found the letter signed Heil Hitler trading the painting in 1941. So this journalist then began writing these scathing reviews and exposés of basically the dodgy way in which the Austrian government had acquired these works, these incredible works, and not just the Adele painting, but a whole series of, of works. And to Austria's credit, at the time, the Minister of Culture said that, OK, if they found any paintings in their collection that had either been physically not returned or due to exportation restrictions and denial had not been returned, they would return the paintings now. Another thing which the Austrian government at the end of the war did to stop all sort of Austrian treasures leaving Austria to these families that had, you know, started a new life internationally was that they tended to have more than one painting. For example, somebody like um, the Blochbauers, they had an, an enormous collection of, at the time, what was contemporary Austrian art. And... What the government said to them, because the, because essentially the government had to approve exportation permits, which they never did, which is another reason why they, they, these paintings were kept in the country. But what they sometimes did was they said, OK, so you've, you're trying to claim back 15 paintings. If you donate five, we will give you an export 
license to take these 10. And it was at the time, it was kind of like the best deal the Austrian government could cut. And I'm not in any way condoning it. It is complete theft and taking advantage of a situation. However, that is what they did. But once this expose was published in 1998, the Austrian government said, okay, if there is evidence that we have done this and tried to trade, you know, paintings that we acquired in order to grant an export license, we will revisit and we will give these paintings back. So upon hearing this, Maria Altman, who was the niece of Adele Blogbauer, who was now living in California at the time, hired a lawyer and asked him to put in a claim to return her family's Klimt paintings. Now, Maria Altman had actually inherited a handful of paintings that belonged to Adele Blogbauer because they too had been victim of the oh, you're trying to take 15 paintings out. Okay, let us keep five and we'll, we'll let you export 10. And essentially, she'd always known this story and the Klimt's were, were what the Austrian government kept. So upon hearing this, Maria Altman, the niece of Adele Blogbauer, who was living in California at the time, called her friend's grandson, who was a new lawyer who was working for a New York law firm and said to him, have you heard of this new regulation that's come in? I would really like you to help me put together a case to try and get my family's Klimt paintings back. So the lawyer, uh, Randy Schunenberg, said, yes, absolutely, I would love to help. And they worked together and compiled evidence and got family papers together and submitted a case to the Austrian government. Now, the Austrian government, this was the third case that they had looked at. And there's an, an incredibly famous family called the Rothschilds who had also escaped during the war. And they'd already given back hundreds of paintings to the Rothschilds. And there was another family that was saw before them that also got back quite a lot of works. And then when they got to Maria Altman's case, because Maria was the niece of Adele Blogbauer, who had been dead for some time at, at this point, and had said, and basically the Austrian government reviewed the case and said, okay, we can give you back a handful of the family's collections. We can give you back some porcelains and some drawings. However, there is absolutely no way we can give you back the Klimt's because of what it says in Adele Blogbauer's will that she wanted these to go to the museum. To which Maria's lawyer replied, well, can you not contest the will because of the regulations at the time and also Adele's husband, Frederick, who had actually commissioned the pieces, had actually put in his will that he did not want the works to go to a museum. He wanted them to stay within the family. And this was all, there was evidence of this and the Austrian government said, mm, they'll see what they could do. And essentially they came back to Randy Schoenberg and said, no, it is our final decision. And if you don't like the fact that we're going to keep the clips, go to court. Well, he was a lawyer, he's going to go to court. So Maria and her lawyer filed a lawsuit against the country of Austria in the USA, which eventually led to a six year legal battle back and forth which ended up at the United States Supreme Court as Austria wanted to dismiss the claim. So the Supreme Court amazingly ruled in Maria's favour and the Austrian government finally agreed to a litigation between, between the city of Austria, or the state of Austria rather, and Maria's lawyer. And this is something that uh, Randy Schoenberg had actually suggested seven years previously before it had been dragged through the courts and at this point it had made international news that this lady who was by now 89 years old uh, was taking the country of Austria to court. Um, there's of course a whole bunch of sort of legal things here which I'm not going to go into because it is kind of mind-boggling and there's an incredible talk given by Randy Schoenberg on YouTube which I will link um, in the show notes below. It's about an hour long where he takes you through sort of the beginning to end of the case and he speaks so incredibly ab about this work and the court case in general and everything that happened. Anyway, so a litigation is essentially where they were going back and forth over what could happen and one of the things Maria's lawyer had suggested that the country of Austria actually buy them However, when the works were valued, they were over a hundred million dollars. And all of a sudden, the Austrian government decided they weren't going to buy them and Maria could have them back. 
And so at 90 years old, Maria was reunited with her family's stolen paintings. But the story doesn't end there. When the works arrived in Los Angeles, there was a small exhibition in 2006 which saw all of the family's Klimt's displayed together for the first time. So this was the two portraits of Adele and three other paintings which the family owned by Klimt. And again, like I said, Maria was then 90 years old and decided actually the best thing to do would be to sell the works at auction. Insurance why she couldn't afford the insurance. She was living in a very, very small apartment but also she was 90. She was thinking of her family and the legacy that she could then leave behind. So the paintings sold at Christie's Auction House in New York. And the decision to sell caused this complete whirlwind of excitement, press interest, bids, conspiracy over who was going to buy them. It was really, really incredible because these were the last unique works of Klimt really available on the open market. So basically, every millionaire in the world was like a kid in a candy store. They wanted it, they were going to have it. So the portrait of Adele Blochbauer, so the gold portrait, was purchased by Ronald Laudier, heir to the Estee Laudier empire, for a mouth-watering and record-breaking $135 million. It set a record, $135 million, and by that point there was only one other work that the hammer had gone down at over $100 million, and that was a Picasso work, which is Boy with Pipe. You know, just for pub quizzes, you never know. And Adele's portrait is now on permanent display in the Neue Gallery in New York, which the family have stakes in, as in like the Estee Laudier family have stakes in. And you might remember me saying right at the start of this podcast that Adele was actually painted twice by Klimt. And the second portrait of Adele Blochbauer, known as Portrait of Adele Blochbauer 2, was actually purchased by none other than Oprah Winfrey, which is just incredible. And it's reported that uh, Winfrey picked up um, Portrait of Adele Blochbauer 2 for a very cool $88 million. Now... This entire sale of the works it is estimated a sum total of three hundred and twenty five million. Not a bad payday for a ninety year old. <laughs> um, and so the works are now in private collections, and the money from the sales was then divided up between Maria and her family and was also used to found the Maria Altman Foundation, which supports the Los Angeles Museum of the Holocaust and other public institutions. Now, sadly, Maria Altman died on the 7th of November 2011 in her home in Los Angeles, so shortly before her 95th birthday. But her legacy and life will always live on. In 2015, the film Women in Gold was released, which saw Helen Mirren star as Maria Altman and Ryan Reynolds as Randall Schoenenberg. So there you are. Not bad. There's also a few books written about it, such as The Lady in Gold, The Extravagant Tale of Gustav's Klimt Masterpiece, Portrait of Adele Blockbauer by Anne-Marie O'Connor. And there's also another book that's written about Maria Altman by someone who was her caregiver later in life, should you at all be interested. And there you have it, a very whirlwind history of Gustav Klimt's portrait of Adele Blockbauer, which I think you will agree is incredibly interesting. And of course, just another example of how art history is so varied and so interesting. And yeah, just look beyond the canvas for the stories that are there. It's just an incredible, incredible story and I really hope you've enjoyed it. It's really one of my favourites. And there you have it, the end of another episode of the Joe's Art History Podcast. I really hope you've enjoyed the story behind the portrait of Adele Bogblauer by Gustav Klimt and I hope it's given you a sort of insight into just how incredible our history is and how to look for a story beyond the canvas. 
there's of course hundreds of stories like this and these stories are still unravelling, particularly works that were stolen and looted during World War II. And this is something that won't even be rectified within our lifetime or even our children and grandchildren's lifetime. It's an incredibly serious issue that people and families face every day continuously. Okay, yes, there's worse things than fighting to get your artworks back. However, there's still a lot of work to be done and there's a lot of great foundations and charities out there that are trying to help families be reunited with their works of art that were wrongfully seized by the Nazis during World War II. I really hope you've enjoyed listening to this podcast. If you have, please make sure that you like, rate and subscribe to make sure that you never miss another episode and I would be really really grateful as it is the season of goodwill to leave me a very nice review on wherever you listen to your podcasts. If you'd like to get in touch to give your thoughts on what I spoke about today you can email me joesarthistory at gmail.com or you can find me on Instagram at joesarthistory and you can DM me and contact me via there. Also, if you know any of these incredible stories from within the history of art that you think, oh, it would be really good to do an episode on that, then please do let me know. I am very, very open to suggestions. Finally, my name is Jo McLaughlin. I have been your friendly host and art historian, and I look forward to welcoming you next time on the Jo's Art History Podcast. Until then, keep learning, and remember, art is for all.